Hello again. Okay, so I've made it to chapter one. I'm not all the way through, but it's pretty dense in terms of the material. So I thought that it would be a good idea to stop off um, and uh, discuss my notes um, and go into depth a little bit on a few different points. So chapter one is very simply called Why Study Language? So why should we study language? I think in Sudan it's very clear that it's really, really important to study language because a lot of learners have English as their second language and in when they're studying Arabic um, they often have to study classical Arabic as well as Sudanese Arabic so they have to make sure um, that the rules and functions of language are very clearly understood so I think when we look at our own context here in Sudan um, it's very obvious but in an English only environment it wasn't so obvious that people need to understand what's going on so um, I think the chapter title is very interesting and throughout the chapter so far we're looking at this question in a variety of different ways um, and it starts off with looking at the question of uh, what are reading problems and wh why do they exist and one of the first questions is do you as a teacher think that reading problems are associated with vision now i think this is quite a tricky question because a lot of teachers, myself included, have encountered students with vision problems who developed behavioral problems, who then wasn't paying attention perhaps, or uh, began to lag behind as a result. Now, once the child started wearing glasses, there was this magical change in both behavior and reading. So, are reading problems associated with vision? I think it depends on how you define the core problem. <laughs> so if somebody can't see the board, that's going to affect their ability to comprehend what's going on in the lesson, in the reading lesson. So that may have an impact on, on their reading. But there's another thing that have been happening that across the world where there was this idea that if you put a colored, a clear colored um, plastic sheet on top of the words, it made it more visible. And I think this is what they're focusing more on in this book. And that, and that kind of tends to indicate that um, those type of problems aren't as, 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 as much a thing as people used to believe they were. And the colored overlays, which is what they were called, the colored overlays didn't really help. Um, though I think it did give some people a feeling like at least they were doing something, especially for people with Erlen syndrome. Okay, so the other thing is, do poor spellers have a visual memory problem? Now, memory has so much to do with reading. Um, when we're reading, especially when we begin to read and we're reading the word cat and you're like K, and then you move on to the le next letter and you're like ah and then you're on to the next letter and you're like T, and then you've forgotten what the first two letters are so you say dog because there's a picture of a dog somewhere on the page. <laughs> um, you know, this is a problem. Uh, but that's a general cognitive your your focus is on identifying the each sound once you begin to develop um your your ability to do that you and you're like cat and you go cat cat and then suddenly you can see it and then you eventually become automatic so you just see the word cat and you say cat and um, so and and this is not a visual memory problem in fact, a lot of poor spellers have amazing memory because they have remembered um, they have remembered so many words 
Like they, they're poor spellers, they're often poor readers, and they have just remembered, they have a huge site bank, more so than most people of, of words they just learned off by heart, but they don't know the, the letter sound correspondences, so they can't really learn new words that easily. Um, so I would say poor spellers do not have a visual memory problem, but um, they haven't uh, mapped the words orthographically, okay? Which means that they haven't, um, they don't, they're, they're unable to figure out um, this, the, the phoneme grapheme correspondences for the word. Okay, does rote practice work, you know? This is also a super interesting question because like our grandmothers are able to recite poems they learned when they were seven or eight years old. Um, at least mine were. <laughs> and they took great joy in being able to pass on that information to us as children. I think that in terms of reading, rote practice does not really have a place, however. Um, and I think also that just learning it off like a robot is really negative. Um, and I think it, it maybe can destroy somebody's love of learning. However, there's more and more studies to show that memorizing is a really, really important skill. So I would say it's not good for reading, but it does help you in other ways. It helps gain fluency, which is an aspect of reading. If you're learning a poem or a song and you learn it off by heart by reading it in different ways and using your voice. Um, so instead of saying, I wandered lonely as a cloud, you're like, I wandered lonely as a cloud. You know, and then if you get the kids to like act it out and, and then they learn it off by heart in a different way, I think that can really work and help build fluency practice. Um, and fluency is really, really an important aspect of reading once you get past the decoding stage. Okay, so does road practice work? Mm, not really in the old fashioned sense, but memorization can have its place. Okay, literacy involves all levels of language processing. Okay, so all levels. And decoding, which is one of the things that we have to do, is involving looking at the letters, but for the most part, visual spatial reasoning does not impact reason, reading. So let's go back to that initial question. Are reading problems associated with vision? Not so much. It's really to look at the letters. You do need your eyesight, but when you see the letter, you remember the sound that that letter makes, okay? So if road practice isn't the most effective instruction, then what is? The most effective instruction emphasizes the forms and uses of language and includes meanings because you want the child or the children to have an authentic experience that they can map in and create connections because connections are how we learn okay the more connections we have the greater chance we have of learning something okay so if we for the first time in our lives we hear about photosynthesis okay that's a huge word. You're like, photo what the <laughs> So it's really, really important. But if you have learned about, um, in year one and year two, you've learned about plants and how they grow and how it requires sunlight and photo comes from the word light and synthesis, you know, and you learn the meanings of all these words. By the time you get to secondary school and you start investigating photosynthesis in a much stronger scientific method it, it it won't be that difficult you're not going to get caught up in it you're going to understand it okay so there is this um let me go to the page in question there is a basic model that people use 
for understanding factors involved in learning to read. And it's called, very simply, the simple view of reading. And it's basically a mathematical equation. Word recognition multiplied by language comprehension is equal to reading comprehension. Okay, I'm gonna let that sink in. I'm gonna continue in the next video.